Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hugh Carp, Nexus Mutual. We've been in touch with Hugh for a long time already, and he's been also very supportive in in uh, bringing ether risk to to what it is right now. And we are very happy to have him here and present us Nexus Mutual. The stage is yours, Hugh. Thanks, Stefan. It's um, exciting to be here, and thanks to Stefan, Christoph, Natalia, and everyone for for organizing the uh, the conference. It kind of brings my two passions of insurance and, and blockchain together. Um, it's a pretty exciting for, opportunity for me as well. This is the first time I'm able to present Nexus Mutual to the public. And I, I guess I couldn't think of a better opportunity to do so. Um, so what, what is Nexus Mutual about? Well, it kind of goes back to actually what insurance is about. And, um, and that's really about the community coming together and sharing risk together and becoming stronger as a result of it. Um, I used to work for a company, an insurance company, uh, in Australia, and I had an old logo that was emblazoned on the top of their building. They didn't use it anymore, but the logo is still there. And it's of a, of a man kneeling, kneeling down with a bundle of sticks resting on his leg, and he's trying to break them. And that actually typifies what insurance is about. You pick up one stick, it's very easy to break it. Put them in a bundle, wrap them together, it's next to impossible. Try it yourself. But that's, that's what insurance is about. It's embedded in statistics, central limit theorem for anyone who knows about all that stuff, but it's about the community coming together. And, that, and that's, what, that's what mutuality is about as well. And so insurance actually started as, as small mutuals in Lloyds and in villages, in communities, trade groups. They came together because they realised that they were stronger together. And they gained, they shared that risk together and became stronger, but they were still limited by their small group that they were in. And so they couldn't, they couldn't expand their membership base, they couldn't access further capital. So, so what did we do? We, we um, employed, we got insurance companies and they intermediated, they, they connected the capital markets with the members or the consumers and they, they made the whole process much more efficient. They, they connected capital, they gained efficiencies, and we became stronger and stronger. But that came at a cost, and that essentially cost was introduced at conflict of interest. The shareholder company's goal is profit, members and the customer's goal is getting claims paid, and obviously there's a tension there, so we've got a fundamental conflict of interest. So then what do we do? We put regulators in place, and they make sure that the the, the insurance companies acted to protect the, the customers, but it added cost to the system. And, and to, be, to be fair, there's a lot of cost, excess cost in that system. Most rough estimates, 30, 35% of premiums are lost in that system, it's the tax on the system. You only get, as a customer, you only get 70, about 70% 70 of your premium back as claims. We have to pay that extra cost. So this, the current system works quite well, but it's plagued by this fundamental mistrust and it's highly inefficient. So this kind of summarises what I've just gone through. On the insurance, on the insurance side of things, we've got this in conflict of interest. We've also got the high expense ratios, 35% increase, premium, legacy admin, regulation, etc. On the right-hand side, we've got mutual problems. Now, mutuals can't, they have a problem scaling trust, they can't scale the membership base. They also have str struggled to access capital markets because they're not shareholder companies, they can't go to capital markets. There are a few good examples, Mass Mutual, <laughs> Bupa, they're large, large mutuals. But by and large, our large insurance companies are shareholder companies. And the mutuals have, have, have disappeared to a certain extent. So, blockchain can solve the mutual problems. It can scale trust between unknown individuals by essentially transferring that trust to code. And by using tokens, it can scale capital in a way that we couldn't do before. And so now, what we do, we have the new technology that can essentially bring back the mutual, address the, the conflict of interest, and I'll also remove 50% of those expenses. So at its heart, 
of the mutual is the claim assessment process. And I'm going to have to go back and re recheck everything I, I've done here against Matan's um, <laughs> presentation, because um, that, that gave me a lot of insight, and I, hopefully most of it's okay, but I'm sure there's a few tweaks to do. But where I'm trying to do decentralized claims assessment. It's not perfect, it's not fully decentralized, but we're getting there. So we've got an incentivized voting mechanic, and, and the way that kind of works is you, you've got tokens, get into more detail later, but there are tokens, you place them as a bond, and you vote. And I guess one of the biggest challenge with insurance claims assessment is that it's grey. It's really hard. Well, it's, it's hard, but then if you try and decentralize it, it's really, really hard. So one of the big problems is you've got a clear incentive for fraud in insurance, and you pay a little amount and you get a big payout if something happens. So there's a massive incentive for fraud. But the claims are also grey, so you don't want to overly punish people for just genuine differences of opinion when the claim, it could have been a claim, it may not have been a claim, it's pretty hard to make a call. But you do want to punish people heavily for fraud. So doing that in a decentralised way is actually very, very challenging. So the way I set it up is you have that bond, you post the bond, and that's, that's exposed to being burned. In the normal case where there's just a consensus outcome of voting yes or no, then the consensus gets rewarded with additional tokens. If you vote against the consensus, then your bond is locked for a further period of time. So there's a light punishment, there's not a heavy punishment. Now, and this is where the centralised part comes in, there's, there will be an advisory board sitting over the top that decides if a claims assessor is voting fraudulently and they have the power to burn the bond. Now, that's not ideal, and that's why we're working towards getting more decentralised in the future, but the underlying claims assessment is decentralised to the membership base. Members decide on their fellow peers' claims. So what are the benefits of this approach? It's product agnostic. My product can be on a piece of paper. And people can decide if that is a valid claim or not. Don't have to code in a specific parametric oracle to, to trigger this particular payout, etc. You can just it can be fully flexible. It's not restricted to parametric covers. I'm actually going to start with parametric, and I like parametric, and I think it's going to have a lot of increasing use cases in the future, but the insurance industry is currently indemnity-based, primarily indemnity covers for a whole bunch of reasons, but I wanted to build a platform that could handle that. So we, we can do any cover we can do, we can do indemnity, but we'll start with parametric because it's easier. Another big benefit, it's not classified as insurance in the UK. It doesn't require an insurance license. That's pretty huge, actually. But um, the, the, the thing is that because this is a mutual a group of people coming together under one entity, there is no contractual obligation between one entity and another entity. And that's not an insurance contract. They have discretion about what, what claims to pay. So this is an existing legal framework that gets used in a normal way, not, not a blockchain way, in the UK, other common law based jurisdictions. It, it operates at the moment. So disadvantages. So obviously it's harder to do. You can attack the system. Um, it's, and it's harder to implement. And I guess it's not fully decentralised yet, but we're working towards that. So that's the kind of core of the mutual. In the next bunch of slides, I'll just go through, because you'll kind of want to know how it works. I'm going to explain how, basically how, how it works and what you can do within the mutual and, and why I've set it up that way. So step one, you've got a bunch of members and they contribute Ether. It will be set up to take ERC20 tokens as well. So the idea being that when someone, possibly apart from Tether, um, introduces a fiat crypto token, um, we, can, we can use that. So they, they, put, they put money into the insurance pool as their membership contribution. In return, they get some tokens. Now, we're going to use a continuous token model here, and that's pretty critical from my perspective, primarily for capital efficiency. 
if we just had like a one month period where you raise a whole bunch of funds, then you have to over raise so that you've got capacity to grow into. But that's really inefficient to start with. Also, when you need more capital at five years down the track or whatever, what, what happens? How do you get it? Um, so I'm using a continuous token model that calibrates the, the price of the token to the capital demands of the insurance pool. And I'll get into that in a bit more detail later on. So the, the idea is that you, you raise a small amount of capital, it's always open and it'll always um, take demand for capital. So the two key components that increase the price of the token are the number of tokens outstanding and the capital levels of the pool. Okay, so now I've got my tokens, what can I do with them? So you can burn them for cover. So there'll be a pricing model and that'll be um, off-chain to start with and then that'll tell you what the price is. Use Oracleize to, to bring the, um, the data on-chain. The, you can actually, one step process, buy then burn tokens, can, it's just condensed into one. So from a customer point of view, if you just want to be a customer, you just do one process. So that's quite, that's quite easy. So that's pretty simple. As I discussed before, you can lock them from transfer to participate as a bond to participate in the claims assessment and more income. That's kind of like the mining aspect of the mutual. And as you see as I go through this, an insurance company needs various functions or services to operate. And what we're doing is we're creating a token that binds everyone together, aligns incentives at a relatively high level, but then allows you to earn income or use those tokens in a certain way to provide the services to the mutual. So what we've done is we've taken an insurance entity and we've broken it up into its component parts and commoditized each function. That's a lot more efficient than the current bundled services approach in the insurance industry. All right, surplus distribution. It's getting a bit more complicated now, but this is kind of the investor side of, of the insurer. So you lock your funds from transfer, and then if there's a surplus distribution in that period, you can get a proportional share of it. Okay, and so how do we, get a, how do we determine if there's a surplus or not? Well, off-chain at the moment, mainly because we don't have scalable complex computation on-chain. Um, we've got a Solvency II-esque model, which basically says, based on the policies that you have in force, this is how much capital you need to hold to be 99.5% sure that you're not going to run out of money. So I've built that. Sits off to the side, every, every day it works out how many policies are there and what the capital requirements are. And says you need this much, and there's a minimum level as well. So as the thing grows, it needs more and more capital. But it doesn't grow in proportion because the more policies you have, the more diversification you have, and the less marginal capital gets added with each policy. So then the capital, capital levels of what's actually in your insurance pool go up and they go down with claim payments and income and all the rest of it. When it gets to 180% of the minimum capital level as defined by the model, it automatically distributes the surplus. If the capital levels drop, the token model over there on the left hand side, that drops the price of the token encourages more capital, supply, demand. So the other thing you can do, this, this whole thing is a DAO as well. DAO's kind of a new thing for actually how these companies operate at the moment. Um, but um, I guess what we're trying to do is automate the governance processes of actually real world existing legal entities and just put them in code. And the, the whole thing is completely upgradable, so if you want to say, you know, we're going to use this code to, um, tomorrow, then you can update any parameters or the entire function if you want to do, and the membership base agrees to do that. So it's a living, breathing organism like a legal membership company that exists at the moment. The other really important aspect here is that all funds in the insurance pool belong to the members and no funds can get out of the pool unless it's agreed to by the membership base. So funds can only come out in three ways. As claims, voted on by members, triggered by the surplus, which is agreed to by the members, that's the code that operates, or as a vote to 
do a product development, a new deployment, um, pay for operational expenses, etc. That's all agreed to by the membership base. So, I mean, one of the things here is that if we go back to insurance regulation, it exists to make sure that members' money is looked after. In essence, we are handing over money to an insurer, they are looking after it for us and handing it back at a later point as claim payments. Regulation exists to make sure that they do that in the right way. Here, membership, the funds can't come out unless it's agreed to by the membership base or defined by the code. So all of a sudden, I know this isn't regulated insurance, but it's designed in a way that it should be okay from a regulatory point of view. If you can trust the code, you can trust, you, you can then transfer the trust and you don't need as much heavy regulation on insurance companies. So I guess we've got an incentive structure that's kind of, the idea is to bind the whole mutual together. And we're commoditizing aspects, different aspects of the, of the insurance value chain and the services that it needs. The other main thing that we're doing is we are connecting members or customers directly with capital markets. The insurance value chain is long and convoluted and there's so many different parties in there and that's one of the reasons why there's 30 to 35% lost throughout the process. Here, we've got code that anyone can interact with and they can take their their part. If you want to be a claims service provider, you can buy tokens and just do claims servicing. If you want to provide capital, you can buy tokens and just do surplus distribution. If you want to be a customer, you can do that, or you can do all of them. It's a, it's a mechanism to bring the one end of the value chain together with the other end of the value chain. So where are we at? Um, I guess I've been working on this a long time. Um, but finally being able to, to go public with it just now. Um, we've confirmed the technical and legal aspects. We have a prototype MVP built. Um, it's live on testnet at the moment. And we're currently sourcing funding to help us get to launch. And the whole, and the whole idea here is that, obviously there's stuff that we need to do to get to launch, but at the launch phase, the membership opens and that effectively crowdfunds the insurance pool or the risk capital that's used to back the contracts. And the, and the whole thing goes live. So the tokens will only go live when the product goes live. And so one of the key aspects here is really that this is members' money. This is not gonna be like an ICO, give us a bunch of money, we'll develop something and then it'll get launched in the future. Um, and the development team has control over it. All of the money raised in that, in that token launch effectively is members' money and it backs their insurance contracts. So that's basically it. I'll keep it, try and keep it short, um, open up for questions. But we're, I'm really just trying to... I, I really like this idea, as you can hopefully <laughs> tell. But it disrupts, it disrupts the core insurance entity and that's what I think the real promise of blockchain technology is about. A lot of insurtechs at the moment are operating in the distribution space, which is, which is great, um, but there aren't many that are really trying to tackle that core insurance entity and really change and make improvements of how that works for the customers. And that's what we're trying to do here, bring back the mutual ethos. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Gil. And we have questions from the audience, please. Sorry, I guess a stupid question, maybe cover this. Where are the members that are voting on claims um, getting their information to make the accurate decision? And how do you prevent them from just following momentum or mob mentality to just be on the right side of things? And then what's the escalation procedure for your group of council or advisors that then know to oversee this? Now you've got 10,000 decisions to make every day. How do they then get the information they need to make the correct decision? I mean, how is this not just a popularity contest? Yeah, good, good question. Um, sorry, I'll go back to the, to the basics. So I'm start, starting with, trying to remember all the questions. Um, starting with basic earthquake insurance cover, which is parametric type in nature. Um, and if you go to USGS, they'll data feed the, if there was a magnitude X earthquake within 100 
kilometres of this location then pay out the bank. So anyone will be able to assess the first claim because you don't need specialist knowledge to do that. The idea is that you start with something like that, it gains some scale, it um, gains members, it gains claims assessors, and then you can start specialising and you go into different subgroups which are more likely to specialise. Second question is, I think that was the, so the escalation procedure on the claims before we get into the decision of if there was fraudulent voting or not. So the escalating decision on the claims is if, if you disagree with a claims um, de decision, the person who submitted the, the claim can then escalate it um, to the entire membership base, not just those who posted the bond um, as a claims assessment. On the assessing the fraudulent activity on claims, there's not going to be too much to start with. Um, and it's going to be pretty clear cut in a lot of places. And if we're starting with parametric, then we should be able to just provide automated um, ways of um, just assessing where there are boundaries. And it's going to be pretty clear whether there's fraud or not. In the future, we're going to need to develop some AI type of technology to um, handle and, and triage stuff because it could get too big, yes. And I guess, yeah, we are on the road to decentralised claims assessment, and that's the part that's actually really tricky to solve. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward about how we can actually do that. And we're looking at various options, but um, there's nothing kind of clear at the moment. Do we have more questions for, for you? In, anyone? Okay, ah, here we have one more. Um, I was just wondering, looking at this, what would you expect the natural size of one of these groups to become? Would it be a, a neighbourhood or an industry or would everyone be in one big group? Oh, to me, everyone's in one big group. Okay. I, I think the, the peer-to-peer -peer thing where you have small groups doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, but um, it doesn't benefit from capital efficiencies. So I'm aiming for a global cover. I'm aiming for this to work from micro-insurance level all the way up to cap bond level. So that's a, quite a diverse group. It won't gain scale at micro-insurance level to start with, but I believe that we should be trying to enable those types of things because um, I think that's where blockchain can, can help out a lot. This is more likely to get scale at the cap bond type level um, hopefully where an insurer or two decides to put a few million of risk through it. That's interesting. <laughs> One more question. How do you make sure that your claims are paid? Are you thinking of holding the reserves or capitals? How, how, do you, how can you make sure that you are actually solvent? So the capital model tells you how much capital you should hold. And it's equivalent to a solvency two model. So are you thinking of having some sort of capital set aside somehow? Some the insurance, the, the risk pool is all held on chain. That's what this is. So is it self-paid? How is it? All the, all the membership contributions go into the risk pool and they back the insurance contracts. And the level of how much capital is actually required is determined by the capital model, which is equivalent to a solvency two type model. So it's equivalent to how insurers operate at the moment. So what do you do if there's not enough capital? Well, I'm not 100% backing the contracts. I'm 99.5% backing the contracts. And that sounds like a very small difference, but it's actually huge in numbers. So you can do simple stats, and maybe Jake's going to talk about that later, I don't know. Um, but basically the, the level of capital efficiency. And this is why insurers operate. This is why we trust insurers, because it, they, could, they bring the capital together and they provide the most efficient marketplace for capital. Um, so at the moment. Um, so the capital model kind of gives you that, that confidence. Also, I guess, this is a, I'm linking blockchain with, an, with a legal entity framework. What that actually means is that I can buy a real life, normal reinsurance contract in the real world. So get some comfort here, start small, and then also go to reinsurer X and say, if this thing runs out of money, I want to buy a policy for that. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone wants. Okay, uh, then thank you so much, Hugh.
Do we, uh, we have one more. Go ahead. No, 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 wait. Sorry. What all parametric models are you considering? Um, you mentioned hurricanes, earthquakes, so those are pretty straightforward. What other ones do, are just at the top of your list? Um, I guess just starting with a basic hurricane, flood, earthquake. It's more likely to be NACAT stuff to start with. You, there, there's um, public data feeds out there. Um, for, for a, and there's wide coverage that you can get, get. So you're more likely to start with natural catastrophes type coverage. Question answered? All right, thank you so much. Another hand of applause for, for you, thank you.